the kinetics of nuclear decay are going to be the topic of this lesson. And we're going to talk about how nuclear decay is a first order process that undergoes exponential decay. And we've got a couple different versions of the equation that we can use to treat this mathematically. And we'll talk about what's called the half-life, the time it takes for half of your radioactive sample to decay. And then we'll finish this lesson off by talking about some different radiometric techniques, speci most specifically radiocarbon dating. Now this lesson's part of my high school chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so nuclear decay or radioactive decay. It turns out that all nuclear decay is what we call a first order process. Now in the realm of what we call kinetics, just you know, discussing the speed of reactions and stuff like that, that means something very specific. Ultimately, the only conclusion you've got to draw from that, though, is that that's where we get these equations. It's these equations that describe first order decay and all nuclear decay is first order decay and is going to follow either one of these equations. Now, it turns out these equations are really just the same equation represented in two different ways. In this one, you can see the exponential decay. So here N it talks about the amount of a radioactive substance you have now whereas, or n at time t, you know, whereas n naught means how much you had initially at time zero. Cool. K we call a rate constant, and turns out chemical reactions even have a characteristic rate constant, and it's related to how fast they go, and we'll figure out how to get that uh, for a lot of nuclear decay processes. And then t here is time. Now you could also take the natural log of both sides here, and the natural log is the inverse function of the exponential function, which is why it makes it kind of disappear here. And you'd have the natural log of how much of a radioactive substance you have now, equal to the natural log of the initial amount of that radioactive substance you had, and again, k is the rate constant and t is the passage of time. Now we've also got to talk about what's called the half-life. So, and, and most radioactive nuclides have a characteristic half-life. And these can be, you know, pretty short on a, on a time scale of a few seconds or a few minutes and things of a sort. Uh, but they can also be very long. Like there are certain isotopes of, say, uranium that's like a billion years for a half-life. And again, the half-life is the time it takes for half of your radioactive sample to disappear. So let's take a look at how this kind of plays out and stuff like this. Let's say that I had, you know, 100 grams of a radioactive substance. And let's just say it has a half-life of 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Well then 20 minutes later, I would only have 50 grams of this radioactive substance left. So after the passage of one half-life, it's a period of time indicative to that particular radioactive nuclide, so that it takes for half of it to decay. Well, after another half-life, in this case, another 20 minutes, it would be down to 20, five grams, half of the amount I had then. And so if you look, this is actually slowing down. In the first 20 minutes, 50 grams decayed. In the next 20 minutes, only we only lost 25 grams, only 25 grams decayed. And in the next 20 minutes, only 12 and a half grams would decay. And in the 20 minutes after that, only 6.25 grams would have decayed, leaving us left with 6.25. And so uh, it turns out we have a variety of different ways we can met, you know, do this. We can do this in terms of the actual mass of the radioactive nuclide. And every half-life, you just keep cutting it in half. So you could also do this in terms of like percentages. So if we did this in percentages, we might just say that initially we had 100%. And after one half-life, you'd only have 50%. After another half-life, you'd only have 50% of 50% or 25%, and then 12.5%, and then 6.25%. So by choosing to start with 100 grams in the first example, it just made it convenient to kind of see the connection here. You could also express this in terms of fractions. So initially you might say that you start with all of it, which we'll say corresponds to one, and then after a half-life, you'd only have a half of what you started with. After another half-life, you only have a half of the half, which is a fourth. One half times one half is a fourth. After another half-life, you'd only have one half of that fourth. And one half times one fourth is one eighth. And then you'd only have half of that, which would be one sixteenth, so on and so forth. So you can do this in terms of mass, percents, fractions. You can also do this in terms of radioactivity. And there's a different variety of, you know, measurements, you know, uh, units we use for radioactivity. We could use uh, the Becquerel and the Curie and the Rad and the Rem and the Gray and 
all these things and I'm not gonna get into these different measurements and stuff like that. So the only one I'm actually gonna use in this lesson is disintegrations per minute. So, but there are lots of ways of actually quantifying, lots of different units we can use to quantify that. I'm not gonna go there. So it just gets a little bit complicated and they all have their place. So, but I'm just gonna use disintegrations per minute and we'll call that the activity. So you could totally do this in terms of activity. Like let's say I told you that the initial activity was 20 and I'll just call it disintegrations per minute. So, well then after a half-life, that would be down to 10 disintegrations per minute. After another half-life, that would be down to five disintegrations per minute. After another half-life, that would be down to 2.5 disintegrations per minute. And after another half-life, that would be down to 1.25 disintegrations per minute. Cool, and this is the way this works and it's, you know, oftentimes this becomes very convenient tool in a variety of fashion. So let's go back to the first one here. Let's say I start you off with 100 grams and I tell you that the half-life is 20 minutes. And then I say, well, how much would be left after an hour? Well, an hour is three sets of 20 minutes, right? And so if 20 minutes is the half-life, well, then an hour going by would be three half-lives and you'd know you need to cut this in half three times. So the first half-life would get you down to 50 grams. The second half-life would get you down to 25 grams. And the third half-life would get you down to 12.5 grams. And so you'd be like, yep, yeah, after an hour, Chad, I'd have 12.5 grams left. Now we could do this a little bit differently as well. Instead, we could say that, hey, we went from 100 grams all the way down to 12.5 grams. And the total amount of time that passed was 60 minutes. And then the question could be, well, then what's the half-life? Well, in going from 100 all the way down to 12.5, you might be like, well, let's see, 100, I have to cut that in half once, twice, three times. So that total of 60 minutes is a total of three half-lives, which means that each one must be only a third of that time, 20 minutes each. So they could ask it to you in a roundabout way like that as well. Now, what if we're not actually doing a perfect number of half-lives? Like, let's say, you know, once again, let's go back. Half-life is 20 minutes, that's given. And let's say I tell again, you start with 100 grams. I, I, so let's go 100%. How long would it take to where you only have 10% left? Well, that's a problem because notice 10% doesn't show up on our timeline exactly for a perfect number of half-lives. Now you can approximate it though because you can see that it's gonna be more than three half-lives and less than four half-lives to where you reach that 10% amount being left. And so in this case, you'd say, well, okay, if that's 20 minutes and that's 20 minutes and that's 20 minutes and that's 20 minutes, then it's going to be somewhere between three half lives and four half lives. That's somewhere between 60 minutes and 80 minutes. And if it's a multiple choice question, if there's only one answer choice in that range, well, then you got it right. You don't even have to do the math. However, if it's not, that's what these equations are for. So a lot of times the math in this chapter really does come down to a perfect number of half-lives and you can avoid a lot of the nastiness of either, either an exponential or using the natural logs. But sometimes you're not gonna get around that. So, and we're gonna see an example of one of those problems in a little bit when we deal with radiocarbon dating. So let's talk about radiocarbon dating and radiocarbon dating is all about carbon 14. Now it turns out that the most abundant isotope of carbon that we have is carbon 12 and 98.9% .9 of all naturally occurring carbon is carbon 12. Now the second most abundant, it turns out is not carbon 14, it's carbon 13. And 1.1% of naturally occurring carbon is carbon 13. You got those numbers, 98.9% .9 is carbon 14, I'm sorry, carbon 12 and 1.1% is carbon 13. And notice that 98.9 .9 and 1.1 add up to 100%. So where's this coming from? Well, it turns out if we got more sig figs there, we'd figure it out. But it turns out it's like 0.005% or something like that. It's a super tiny amount of carbon 14 that we have. And that carbon 14, it turns out, is actually coming from nitrogen 14. So, and when cosmic rays hit nitrogen 14 in the Earth's atmosphere, it converts it into carbon 14. That's where the carbon 14 we have comes from, but it only happens to a very tiny extent. So, and then that carbon 14 itself is gonna undergo radioactive decay. And so what happens is at some point, you know, way back in the day, so the amount of carbon 14 being produced and then the amount decaying kind of reached an equilibrium. So in some constant amount existing, you know, in the atmosphere. 
Now, this radioactive carbon-14, again, comprises a very tiny percent of the amount of carbon, uh, you know, on planet Earth and stuff like this. So, but this carbon-14 also then gets incorporated into living things. Because like you and I breathe oxygen, plants breathe in carbon dioxide. And that's where this radioactive carbon-14 ends up. It ends up as part of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. And the plants take it in. And the plants take in that radioactive carbon-14, but then it decays. And the plants take more in, it decays. And so then an equilibrium amount uh, is achieved inside those plants. But then animals come and eat those plants. And so the animals take in that radioactive carbon-14 and it decays. And then they eat more plants and, and then it decays. And, and then there's an equilibrium amount reached in those animals as well. And then other animals come and eat those animals and take in the radioactive carbon-14 and so on and so forth. And so ultimately, everything that is alive is gonna come to this equilibrium amount of carbon-14. So until they stop taking more in. And the moment they die and stop eating, so to speak, or start, stop taking of your plant, stop taking in you know, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, you have a time stamp because you're no longer taking in any more carbon, uh, radioactive carbon-14, but the, one, the stuff that's in you is decaying. And so the amount of radioactive carbon-14 in something that has been dead for a long time is much lower than for something that is still alive today. And we can compare the two and get an idea of how old that lovely substance is. Now, the key is this only works for things that were once alive. We can't date like a rock unless there's like a fossilized animal in that rock or something like that, but we can't just date a rock. We can only date things that were once alive, things derived from either plants or animals. All right, so if we take a look at this, it turns out that the half-life for radioactive uh, carbon-14 is 5,730 years. And because we know this half-life time, and we know that it's largely, we can't really you know, find an environmental influence to change this number. So then if we look at how much radioactive carbon-14, like, you know, some old piece of wood has, or some piece of cloth that was made from cotton, you know, or something along these lines, or the remains of some animal from, you know, whatever period, we can look and find out, you know, we can measure very accurately how much radioactive carbon-14 it has in it, and compare that to how much radioactive carbon-14 living organisms today now have. And based on that, we can approximate how old those things are. Now, there are other radiometric dating techniques for dating things that were, you know, that might you might use to date the rocks and stuff like this, like uranium dating or potassium argon dating or things of this sort. So, and they can be used to get much older dates and stuff like this. But radiocarbon dating only can be used for living things. And it turns out by the time you go through about 10 half-lives, there's so little radioactive carbon-14 left that we really can't accurately measure it. And so this is good up to about 50,000 years, give or take. And the older you go, the less accurate and more approximate your dating becomes of whatever object you're dating. So just keep that in mind. So if we look at your handout here, the question we're actually gonna try and answer here, it says that the carbon-14 activity of a piece of cloth at an archeological site is 13.1 disintegrations per minute. And then we're told that the, if the carbon-14 activity of living organisms is currently 16.3 disintegrations per minute, uh, what is the approximate age of this piece of cloth? Now, the first thing we can look at this and be like, okay, if living organisms today is 16.3, what would it be after a half-life? Well, after a half-life, it would be like 8.15. So, and that would be 5,730 years. So, but in our case, we're not even down that low. So we can already say that this thing is not even 5,730 years old. So we'll start there. So, but how do we actually calculate this out? Well, again, this is not a perfect number of half-lives. So we can't just, you know, give a number. We're gonna have to use our lovely equations here. And personally, I like the logarithmic ones here. So, but we're also gonna use this one here which relates the half-life to the rate constant. And if you notice, those are the only two variables in this equation. So if you know the half-life, well, then you can calculate the rate constant. If you can calculate the rate con if you know the rate constant, well, then you can calculate the half-life. Well, in our example, we know the half-life. We're gonna use this equation to use that to calculate the rate constant. We'll then take that rate constant and be able to plug it into this equation. And this equation's ultimately gonna allow us to calculate. So how, uh, actually, I guess we'll use it to solve for the time in this particular example. All right, so this is the way this works. Now, this equation right here, it turns out, comes from taking the fact that after a half-life, 
the amount of n compared to n naught, this would be exactly half of this. And it turns out, property of logs, that this actually comes from the natural log of one half which is 0.693. That's at, where, um, or is that the natural log of two negative? I don't know. It's one of those two, but it's, that's where the 0.693 actually comes from and ends up being a constant specifically for a half-life. And so in our case here, if we rearrange this, we're gonna say that K equals 0 0.693 over the half-life. And so in our case, K is gonna equal 0 0.693 over 5,730 years. So, if we take 0 0.693 divided by 5,730, we get 1.21 times 10 to the negative 4. And this is going to have units of years to the minus 1 power. So it's 1 over years for units. So it's kind of like 1.21 times 10 to the negative 4 per year is the way that really works out. And now we're going to take this equation, and if you take this equation, we're going to rearrange it just a little bit. We're going to take and subtract this to the other side and have ln of n minus ln of n naught equals negative kt. So we're gonna start there. But there's a property of logs, if you recall, where if you're subtracting separate log terms, you could combine them into a single log term and divide n over n naught equals negative kt. And that's the approach we're gonna take here to solve for t. So in our case, we have ln, and in this case, the n and the n naught can be grams, percents, fractions, or radioactivities. So as is the case here. And so right now our radioactivity is 13.1 disintegrations per minute. But for initially, right at the time that it died, it would have been the same as living things today is the assumption we make at 16.3. And so in this case, then we get negative, and here's our k, 1.2 times 10 to the negative four per year. and then times time. Now let's do our math here. So first we're gonna take the natural log of 13.1 divided by 16.3, and then we're gonna divide that by negative 1.2 times 10 to the negative four. And in this case, we've gotta be careful of our units here, but because our uh, rate constant is in units of inverse years, our time will come out in years. And in this case, we get 1,821 years rounded to the nearest year. Cool. And we just count backwards that many years. We can see, oh yeah, this was uh, you know somewhere in the ballpark of 200 AD or something like that. So, and like I said, the older this gets, the more approximate this becomes. So, but for something about this age, probably gonna be fairly accurate for us. Cool, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems for nuclear chemistry, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is available.